All right, we're looking at the domain of this. For the natural log of t plus 1, I said that t plus 1 had to be greater than 0, which means that for this piece of the function, t has got to be greater than negative 1. Then I've got to look at the next piece. Look at this part. If you have t over the square root of 9 minus t squared, the part you're concerned with is your denominator. It's a radical. The radical can't be, well, first of all, you can't have 0 in the denominator. And the next thing you can't have is a negative under the radical sign. So you have to take what's under the radical sign, the 9 minus t squared, and it is going to have to be greater than 0. So if this is true, 9 has got to be greater than t squared. So that means t squared, well, t is going to be between 3 and negative 3. t squared has got to be less than 9, so that means t has got to be between negative 3 and positive 3. And then when you look at this last piece, if you look at 2 to the t power, t can be anything for here. So it doesn't matter right here. So your job for the domain of this entire vector function is to put these two things together. This one says that t has got to be greater than negative 1, if that's negative 1. This piece said that t had to be bigger than negative 3 and less than positive 3. So actually, this piece right here is what is going to be your function domain. You have to put it together and take what works for everything. So the domain of this function is going to be from negative 1 to 3. This is an interval. This is interval notation. This is not an ordered pair. So as long as you're, the numbers you pick are between negative 1 and 3, this function works. Is everybody okay about domain? Just look at each piece just like you would in algebra and pick out what doesn't work. Alrighty, well, we need to be able to take the limit of a vector function. To take the limit as t approaches a of a vector function, you just take the limit of each of the components. The limit as t approaches a of f of t, limit as t approaches a of g of t, and the limit as t approaches a of h of t. And the limit is going to give you a vector. So let me look at one of your book, number three. The limit as t approaches 0 of e to the negative 3t t squared over sine squared of t and cosine of 2t. Two Okay, so what you do is just take the limit of each of these pieces. So you take the limit as t approaches 0 of e to the negative 3t. In this case, all you do is substitute in. e to the 0 power is going to give you 1. So this is a 1. I'm going to skip the middle one for a minute. I'm going to go on to the second one, the last one. The limit as t approaches 0 of the cosine of 2t. If I substitute again, the cosine of 0 is 1. And I left this one off for a minute. Because when I look at the limit as t approaches 0 of t squared over the sine squared of t. If I try substitution, I'm going to get 0 over the sine of 0 is 0. 0 under, excuse me, 0 divided by 0 is undefined. It's one of those indeterminate forms. 
So if you're going to do the limit, you really need to look at L'Hopital's rule again. I think we did that yesterday. Where you just take the derivative of the top, which is 2t, the derivative of the bottom is 2 sine t times the derivative of sine, which is cosine. That still didn't help because I still have 0 on the bottom. So then you take the derivative of, one more time, the derivative of the top is 2. The derivative of the bottom, this is a product. The derivative of sine is cosine, so 2 cosine squared t minus the derivative of the cosine 2 sine squared t. Now I can look at the limit. The limit as t approaches 0. Top stays 2. The bottom, the cosine of 0 is 1. The sine of 0 is 0. This simplifies to 2 over 2, which is 1. So when I take the limit, I get the vector 1, 1, 1. Take your limit just like you would have in any other calculus class. You just take the limit of each piece. You get a vector. Okay? Now, to think about sketching the graph of these vector value curves, we kind of relate it to what's called a space curve. So vector functions and space curves are very closely related. A space curve is the set of all points C, points now, that are in space where X is the F of T, Y is the G of T, and Z is the H of T. This is called a space curve. And these should remind you of like parametric equations that we did in calculus three, I think. So when we think about graphing a vector function, we're really going to think about graphing a space curve. What is that vector tracing out up here in space? As you get the different vectors, what kind of shape are you getting? Okay. Because if you think back to, if you just look back at that, how difficult is that going to be to graph? If I took different points for P, I'm going to have to graph that vector. When I take another point, I'm going to have to get another vector. Then I'm going to have to combine them all together. And how difficult is that going to be, especially in three dimensions? So, this is obviously done well with computer graphing. I'm going to copy that. get down what you want to get. Okay. Here are some space curves. That one, that one. Those are examples of space curves. I don't think I could whip that out in a few minutes, you know, or that one either. Three-dimensional, they're very well done with computers as opposed to doing them by hand. Your calculators may do it. I cannot for the life of me figure out how to do it on the calculator, but I'll just, I'm just having brain shut down. But I do know that there are all sorts of things out there on the internet that, where you can graph 3D functions. I found this one this morning, and I graphed one of the functions, and if you'll notice, I can rotate it around and look at it, and it's a lot more helpful than me trying to do anything that I could do. This one is actually problem 23, I think. No, it says, what is it? Uh, it's cosine t, sine t, one plus, okay, it's, it's this one. I put, pick 22 out of your book. And I graphed it, and this is what I got when I graphed it. And my job is to try to match it to one of these pictures down here. And that's what you're going to have to do on homework. <laughs> Go online or use your calculators, find some way to graph these. I'm not asking you to do it by hand. 
and then match it to the one. I would say that this picture matches that one. Whoops, I don't know where it went. Okay, there it is. So is that going to be on the bed? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> Probably not, but I did want you to spend the time just to look at it and see what it looks like. I mean, computers do this great. We don't, but anyway, uh, if you just look at that on the, anything that it asks you to graph, just pull it out this and figure if you figure it out on your calculators, well, y'all let me know how to do it. Okay. I just can't get it. So anyway, that being said, let's look at some of the problems you are going to have to do. As my graph just starts spinning up here. <laughs> it's just spinning. <laughs> Okay, some of the things you're going to have to do is find parametric equations for some of the different shapes. The ones that I've chosen, this is number 18 in your book. Find a vector equation and parametric equations for the line segment that joins point P to point Q. And this is a line segment. All right, so this is exactly what we did back in chapter, uh, the last chapter we just got through with. To find the parametric and vector equations for this line segment, you need your vector that's parallel. So find a vector, and I'll just call it my vector V. Negative 3 plus 1 looks like negative 2. 5 minus 2 is 3. 1 minus negative 2 looks like 3. So I need a point and a vector. I'm going to use this point. If you will do this my way, we have to get a segment here. So we're going to have to have a starting point and an ending point. If you will do this my way, then you'll be able to tell the starting point and the ending point. You'll be able to tell me what T is. So parametric equations. X is going to be negative 1 minus 2t. Two two. Y is 2 plus 3t. And z is negative 2 plus 3t. And t is going to vary from 0 to 1. You have to have that because it is a segment. It has to have a starting point and it has to have an ending point. If you do this my way, it will always be 0 to 1. If you do it your way, you got to figure out what the t's are. Now my way, I subtract the vectors this way and I use this as my first as my point. Because when t is 0, I get the point negative 1 2 negative 2. There's my first point. When t is 1, I'm going to get negative 3. When t is 1, I'm going to get 5. When t is 1, I'm going to get 1. This gives me the correct starting point and the correct ending point when my segment goes from here to here. Okay? And this is part of, of your equation. So these are parametric. They wanted vector. When they did the vector, all they want on web assign is just to write it like this. So here's parametric, here's vector. So if I did sketch the graph of this, it would be a line segment. Is there a question about those? All right, something else you may have to do, something like 31. At what point does the curve R of T, which is T, that's I, there's no J, K is 2t minus t squared. Where does this curve intersect the paraboloid z is x squared plus y squared? I need to know a point or points where it these two things intersect. All you have to do is use this as your x x is t, y is 0, 
and z is 2t minus t squared. Substitute these into your equation. So z is 2t minus t squared, and that is equal to x squared. And y squared is 0. So if I solve that, I move everything over there, 0 is equal to 2t two squared minus 2t two maybe. Factor out of 2t two two and that leaves me with t minus 1. Setting those equal to 0, I'm getting t is equal to 0 and t is equal to 1. This is not the answer. They want the points of intersection. So the points of intersection, you go right back up here. If t is 0, then you get the point 0, 0, 0. If t is 1, I'm getting the point 1, 0, 2 minus 1, which is 1. So those are the two points where this curve intersects this shape. Okay, so this is not what you're looking at, but this is the idea you've got a shape here and a shape here, and you're looking at what does it look like when it intersects it. That's the idea. Alright, the other thing that you have to do in here is if we're talking about space curves, these can model like an airplane or something flying through space or a rocket. If this were one pathway and this is the other one, you might be interested to know, do these two pathways intersect? Or, if this is two rockets, are they actually going to collide? Is that rocket going to run into that rocket? Are they going to be at the same place at the same time? Which might be a very important question if you're launching a satellite. You certainly don't want it to hit somebody else's pathway at the same time. It's okay if the pathways cross but as long as those rockets or whatever are not in the same place at the same time. So we're going to look at a problem like number uh, 49, which says, if two objects travel through space along two different curves, it is often important to know whether they will collide. Will a missile hit its moving target? Will two aircraft collide? The curves might intersect, but we need to know whether the objects are in the same position at the same time. And here are our two project trajectories. Here's one pathway. It's t squared, 7t minus 12, t squared. This is one pathway. The second one, is 4t minus 3, t squared, and 5t minus 6. The question is, do they collide? Do they collide? Are they at the same place at the same time? That means the t's are going to have to be the same. So what we need to do is set up equations. This one equal to this one, this one to this one, and this one to this one, and see if we can solve all three equations and get something that works. So put t squared equals to 4t minus 3. 7t minus 12 is equal to t squared. And then the last one says t squared is 5t minus 6. So 
So what I would do is I would take one equation and see if I can solve it. So if I tried to solve this one, this t squared minus 4t plus 3 is equal to 0. t minus 3 and t minus 1 maybe. So t is equal to 3 and 1. Y'all are checking my arithmetic. I know you are. Then what I would do is I would take these and see if they work in these two equations. It's got to work for everything. So I would take t is equal to 3. If I put 3 in here, I'm going to have 7 times 3 minus 12. Is that going to be equal to 9? 21 minus 12 does look like it's 9. So t is equal to 3 worked there. Then I would go to the next one. Is t equal 3 work in the next one? So that's going to be 9. Is that equal to 15 minus 6? 9 equals 9. Yes, it looks like t equals to 3 works in everything. So unfortunately, it looks to me like they're going to collide. I don't have to go any further. If they collide once, it doesn't matter if they collide a second time. So it looks like they're going to collide when t is equal to 3. Do they ask for the point? No, they do not. But if they ask for the point, all you have to do is put it back into your equation and get a point. An x, y, and a z. Yes, I think that's good enough. If they hit each other, <laughs> I'm only going to want to hit you once. Okay? I'm not going to want to come back for, for more. <laughs> but yes, these collide. Now you're going to be asked if they had not collided. All right, let me just ask, to just play pretend for a second. Suppose when t is equal to 3, I got something that was not true and not true. And when t is equal to 1, I got something that was not true and not true. Pretend for a minute. They would not have collided, correct? Does that say anything about whether their paths cross or not? No, it does not. So if you're just interested in whether the paths cross, what I do, and what I think the book does, is I choose two different variables, maybe S's in one and T's in one, and see if you can find S's and T's that work. Do I probably need to show something like that? We did that in uh, other sections, didn't we? I think. It does sound familiar. And I think there's one like that on homework where you have to find the intersection point. Yes. So I remember with yes. And T's. yes, 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 do the same thing. I'm going to let you guys see if you can figure that out. I know I've got one on homework that asks more than just collide. They ask if the paths cross. That means they're just at a different place at a different time. And it can cross more than once. But if they're asking if they cross, use two different variables. 